So we're going to look at weight and balance. Hopefully you've had a little bit of uh, previous background with this. But what we found is a lot of the students, by the time you got here, either it's been quite a while since you've done weight and balance or kind of the introductory weight and balance. We need to go beyond what you originally uh, learned when we're doing some of the things we need to know for 100 hours, annual inspections, and just general uh, long-term upkeep and maintenance on aircraft. So a few vocabulary items that we got to be aware of. We're going to talk a lot about the datum, and this is our, our ultimate reference for weight and balance. So it's a vertical plane. It's somewhere where we cut the airplane, and it's going to be, we're going to measure everything longitudinally from that plane. Okay, and it can be anywhere. On some aircraft, it's out in front of the airplane. On some aircraft, it's at the tip of the spinner. On some aircraft, it's at the firewall. It could be somewhere on the tail. It could be the gear. It could be anywhere that the manufacturer puts it. And all horizontal measurements are taken from there. Uh, and it doesn't matter where it's at. In fact, you could, you could, in theory, make your own datum for your calculations. And as long as you're using it, if, you know, as long as you're not using different datums, uh, your calculations will work. They'll just, the numbers will be slightly different. An arm is a distance from that datum, so the horizontal distance from that, that, that plane of reference to any point on the aircraft. Uh, typically, nose to tail, you know, horizontal distance, but there are, there are arms for roll and that kind of thing if you're, if you're doing left, right, although mainly what we're looking at is the aircraft weight and balance nose to tail uh, for, for controllability uh, in regards to pitch. A moment is if we take the, a force, such as weight, and we multiply it times the arm, that gives us a moment. That's a torque. You're, you're, you're all familiar with a torque wrench, and when you put your hand on a torque wrench with a certain amount of force at a given distance, right, that creates a torque. And so a moment is a torque, uh, but in the airplane. And then finally, the center of gravity, that's what we're trying to find. That's the point, the theoretical point at which the entire airplane is balanced. So that's if we were to able to, to string or hold the airplane up by the CG point, the plane should sit there and balance perfectly level uh, front to back, or if it's also the left-right CG, left to right. But again, we're mainly looking at fore and aft uh, CG. So here are some of those illustrated. So we have an airplane on the left, and our datum in this, in this case is probably, this would be typically about the firewall area. But again, that datum, oh, they're leading edge of wing, excuse me. So here it's the leading edge of the wing. Again, it could be the firewall, it could be the tip of the spinner, it could be way out here in front, it could be the main landing gear. Again, it's wherever the manufacturer sets it. And even different, sometimes aircraft in, the same aircraft in different series, they may put the datum in a different location. So you gotta pay attention to that too. You know, maybe an earlier version of it, they put it at the spinner, and a later version of the airplane, they put it at the firewall. I don't know why. Um, bigger aircraft, the aircraft, some of the aircraft I worked on, they had the datums that were out in front of the airplane. And that was a holdover from either when they designed the aircraft, where the zero point was on their uh, CAD screen, or it was when they were doing test flights, oftentimes they put a long kind of boom out the nose with a very, a very sensitive pedo, pedostatic instrument that they want to get away from, it, and it's where that mounts when they attach it to the airplane. Uh, so when you see it out front, that's not uncommon, it does happen. And then the arms, if they're behind the datum, they're always going to be positive. If they're in front of the, the arm, in front of the datum, they're going to be negative. And then we've got our wrench over here illustrating a moment, which is the product a force at a given distance, or force times distance. And it's how much torque, how much twist is going to be put around the thing. And where this comes into play is on our airplane, if we have a weight, say the engine in front of the datum, right? And maybe something like baggage behind the datum. You know, if the arms are equal, they balance each other out, or the point where all those sum together to balance out is that center of gravity. And the most important aspect of center of gravity with an aircraft is that it is within the a range that typically is somewhere on the wing, the center of lift. 
Now, if that datum is, or if that center of gravity is too far back, the plane's going to be tail heavy. It's going to want to pitch up. If it's too far forward, it'll be nose heavy. They'll have trouble getting the nose off the ground. They don't want to. The nose will want to park itself on the ground. So a few other things. Once we have those, the basic elements, then we can start to understand how the plane acts or how these affect different measurements of the plane. So the first one is empty weight. And this is things that it's the aircraft, including all operating equipment that has a fixed location and is installed on the aircraft. Okay? That's the permanently installed items, essentially. So things like the airframe and the power plant, any kind of required, optional, or special equipment that's installed. And we'll look at what is required, optional, or special equipment, and how do we define that. Fixed ballast, so if we have an aircraft, when it's all said and done, uh, if it does not fall in the correct center of gravity range, if the, if the center of gravity doesn't fall in the correct range, we can add weight to the airplane in order to fix the balance. Okay, and that would be permanent fixed ballast. Once a plane gets loaded, oftentimes we'll have to add uh, temporary ballast if, uh, if you have a plane that's not loaded correctly. Um, and then finally, things like hydraulic fluid, residual fuel, and oil, and that kind of thing. We'll look at those because, like, oil has some special cases. There's two different ways that we have to treat engine oil, for instance, uh, depending on the, the time when the airplane was certified. So the empty weight center of gravity is when the airplane is at that empty weight, where is its center of gravity located? Okay. And that's not always within the flight legal range because an airplane has never flown, flown empty. Right? You're always going to have fuel on board. You're always going to have at least a pilot on board, hopefully. You're always going to have, um, you know, I guess that's probably the minimum. You could potentially have baggage on board. You could have passengers on board. You could have flight mall magazines on board. You could have coffee on board. You can have animals on board. You can have, you get the idea. Everything loads up and that's all added together to get a loaded center of gravity. But we're, we're looking at, most of the time in maintenance, we're looking at the airplane empty. Okay, we'll look at a loading calculation later, but the pilots would be the ones to, the pilots, the operator is going to start with the empty weight and the empty weight CG that we as technicians determine. And they're going to use that as their starting point for all of their load calculations. So it's very important that we give them the correct empty weight and the correct empty weight CG because all of their calculations, which are critical for safety, are based off of these two numbers. And if we give them the wrong number from the get-go, they're going to have the wrong number when they're done loading the airplane. Useful load. Pilots, operators, and I, you know, I say pilots, but operators, the airline, or the cargo operator, or you know, whoever, they're going to want to know how much can we carry, maximum allowable gross weight, minus the empty weight. Okay, so what's that difference? Max allowable gross weight or max takeoff weight? How heavy can the airplane be and go fly? How heavy is it when we started? That's how much we can load from one to the other. Okay. The maximum gross weight is the max authorized weight of the aircraft and its contents. This is going to be indicated in the uh, aircraft specifications or the type of data sheet. The minimum weight, the empty weight, and the empty weight CG are not necessarily indicated in TCDS because those can be, those can be altered. If you make a change to the airplane, if you add or remove equipment, even if you repaint an aircraft, it can change. And so those aren't really specified, but what is specified is the TCDS. If you take that, you take your empty weights and you add stuff to it, how much can you carry and what's the max you're allowed to do? Some aircraft have a maximum ramp or taxi weight that is higher than the maximum gross weight or max takeoff weight. These are all kind of subversions of the max gross weight. So heaviest weight that an aircraft can be loaded while sitting on the ground. That's in contrast to the maximum takeoff weight or MTAU which is the heaviest weight that the aircraft can have when it starts its takeoff roll. Why would we have a difference here? Why this, why maximum ramp taxi weight versus a, versus a max takeoff weight? Yeah. You can burn a little, little bit of fuel taxiing out to the end of, end of the runway. This is like long haul big aircraft stuff, right? They're gonna be flying a 16 hour flight from New York to Dubai. 
or maybe even longer than that, it might be 17 or 18 hours, right? They're gonna need as much fuel as they could possibly take. So they're gonna, the plane's gonna be certified to actually have a certain amount of fuel that can be burned off getting from the gate to the runway, okay? And that's that difference. Maximum landing weight, even though we can load the plane up to this max takeoff weight, if we take off at MTAU, we can't necessarily land that way. Why not? What's important about landing? Is what? Length of the runway could be part of it, probably less so in this case. I mean, what? What about the landing gear? There's a weight capacity, and it's not just landing gear, but it's the entire structure. Okay, the structure, when, they, when the airplane lands, when you touch down in an airplane, that, that structure, and I don't, I don't know off the top of my head what the max is, but it's several Gs. Usually somewhere around, I want to say it's between three and five Gs of deceleration when you touch down, right? So it multiplies that weight. Right? When you hit the ground, it's not, you know, if you have a 100,000 pound airplane, the gear for a brief second may experience somewhere around two or three or 400,000 pounds, right? So there's pro oftentimes there's a limit max landing weight. That's why the 727 has the fuel dump system on there. In systems, we looked at that, the ability to dump fuel. That's if you take off above max landing weight, that's to be able to dump fuel to return to the field if there's an emergency. It still takes time. You have to be able to dump down to max landing weight in 30 minutes, I think is the number. I'm going off memory here, it's been a while since I looked it up. But you have to be able to get down to that weight. Some airplanes can burn it fast enough. Some airplanes, the max takeoff weight and the max landing weight are the same, and then they don't have to have a fuel dump. Some, if you're able to burn the fuel off with the engines within that time period, you don't have to have a dump system. But bigger aircraft, where they can't do that, they have to be able to dump fuel. And then finally, maximum zero fuel weight. This isn't kind of an official one, but this is one you will see in cargo and airline world a lot. And that is the heaviest weight that the aircraft can be loaded without having any usable fuel. That's the assumption that you want the ability to add fuel, right? So you can have, you can have zero fuel, but you can have all your other, you can have passengers on board, you can have baggage on board, and you just know, okay, from there, how much more fuel can I add, which affects your range. Sometimes it's a trade-off. You may not be able to fill a plane full of passengers if, it's, if you need the extra capacity for weight or for range. We also have things called operating empty weight or basic operating weight, and this is what our aircraft went off of at the airlines. This is the assumption that we have an empty weight, right? But the empty weight doesn't include galley service, right? All the cans of Coke, the sandwiches, the coffee, the, wa the potable water, the lavatory, the juice, blue juice in the lavatories, right? But as an airline, we're going to have all that stuff on board, right? The magazines and the seat back pockets, you know, all that stuff had, would be included in this. So we said, okay, even though normally you calculate off basic, normally you calculate off empty weight, we would use a bow, basic operating weight. And that was our useful load was the difference between bow and max gross weight because the plane's always going to be serviced, well, most of the time is going to be serviced with potable water for coffee, hand washing, and tea. The plane's going to have cans of Coke and sandwiches on board. Maybe. The plane's going to have ice on board. There's going to be a magazine in every seat back pocket. There's going to be blue juice in the lavatory. Um, I think it actually included, I want to say it included crew weight, pilot, co-pilot, flight attendants was included in there. Um, I think it also, going off memory, included their baggage. You know, they're going to have a, a suitcase with them. Right, so that was all considered. You're going to have that to operate the airplane, so that's that's always factored in. So, yeah, there we go. That's right. I forgot I hit them there. So, crew weight, fluids necessary for operation, up besides fuel, pretty much, and then those that are already included, like engine oil and uh, and hydraulic fluid, uh, operational items, and then certain items, personnel, equipment, supplies that are necessary for full operations. We had a go kit in our airplanes. We had a tub in our back that was always in our cargo bay. Had a jack in it, had a spare tire in it, had some Kansas Skydraw, had a hydraulic servicing pump in it. 
that's not required equipment. It was something our airline put in there for reliability. So we could, you know, if we had a road trip, had to go fix a plane somewhere, we had some basic supplies. That was that was part of the basic operating weight because it was always on board the airplane. For every airplane out there, it's going to have a comprehensive equipment list. Right? So all equipment that's available, it's not an aircraft specific though, right? You can have different versions, different options. Think about these as like your customer options, right? Um, but it this list is included typically in the POH or an aircraft flight manual. It's organized by ATA code and maintenance manual chapter. And it's going to, this is where we get into that required versus standard versus optional versus additional equipment. Standard equipment, this is your bare bones airplane. Probably has cloth seats, has the basic interior, has the basic avionics, basic instrumentation in it. When you start adding, then that's required for FAA certification. Standard equipment items, are still kind of that, that's maybe going from like your work truck to just the basic consumer, you know, vehicle, okay? Maybe there's a few creature comforts upgrades, but still it's considered, this is like adding the power door, the power locks and power windows, right? Most cars come standard with that nowadays, okay? Maybe some work trucks still have the cranks in them and they have just the AM FM radio. That would be like the required. Now standard is, okay, you add, there might be a few things that are creature comforts, or that are upgrades, but they come on every version of the airplane, every 172, every Cirrus. Optional is items that can replace standard or required. Right, now we're going from the cloth seats to the leather seats, right? But we don't need the cloth seats anymore. So those would replace, right? The leather seat covers replace the cloth seat covers. They may weigh a little bit more or maybe a little bit less. Right, so they might have a change in that, but but you could order your plane upgraded with the leather seats. Or you could upgrade to, you know, from dial indications, analog gauges to maybe flat screen, in, you know, Garmin displays, right? And then um, A is additional optional equipment. So these are things you can add on that don't replace other items, okay? Maybe this is adding the ability to do Bluetooth into your into your comm radio so you can listen to music, right? Or the ability to, or adding, you know, adding other kinds of comfort, adding entertainment systems or adding things like that. So that's your additional. So these are carried in, like I said, the flight manual or the pilot's operating handbook. This is an example of a 172 pilot's operating handbook. And here's the comprehensive equipment list that's going to have, and here it talks about, here's your required standard, optional, or additional equipment. And it's going to have the description, what's called a reference drawing. Those are the engineering things that say, hey, this is what it looks like. Weight and arm, and it's in a table that looks like this. So here's your ATA coded number for each item. Each number has an ATA code format number. You can see they're classified as R or S or additional, right? Single axis autopilot, you can add that. It's not a standard item. Most people hopefully probably get it. Um, so there's, there's no optional stuff on here. It's all additional so far. There's the reference drawing, a description of it, its weight and its arm, its location. Okay. Another page. So optional, required, standard. So now here you've got some of the optional stuff. So here's the standard, 2404S, seat, front passenger, vertical adjust cloth. And then optional, 2505-O, seat, front passenger, vertical adjust leather. That's what I was talking about, you can upgrade the leather. Or you have another optional. Here's seat, front passenger, vertical adjust leather slash vinyl. All right, it's, it's another seat cover. You know, now you can have a rear cloth, a rear leather, a rear leather slash vinyl. You've got your main, your primary shoulder harness. You can add a shoulder harness that has additional adjustments and that kind of thing on it, right? So that's what we're talking about with that. So again, this will be in there and it applies to, you know, you're not gonna have a plane, right? That has every one of these options on it, right? You get the leather seats, it deletes the cloth seats. So you gotta kind of know what's in there, but again, 
ATA, whether it's how it's required, descriptions, reference running weights and arms. This is used in addition to a weight and balance table. In the weight and balance table, you are going to be responsible for creating and filling out. So here's an example. It's going to have aircraft registration serial number, so we know which one it is, the date it was created. And then you are going to put this into the POH or flight manual. Old school was the POH or flight manual. Basically, had a blank one of these you could fill in. Nowadays, you print like a new page, it goes in there, or even the manufacturer has a way you can add a official looking page. But here is, you're gonna do the start with the standard empty weight. Here's optional equipment, special equipment, paint, sometimes paint changes it. We add an unusable fuel and get a basic empty weight. And so we get a weight and we get a moment and with those, we can also calculate in the arm. We'll get into that in a minute. This is just kind of an example of what kind of information would be shown on those tables. So here's one where you would write it in, okay? So a Part 23 certified aircraft, you'd have a basic M, uh, empty weight and balance table here. This is for the Baron, the 58P. So once you have this filled out then, as changes are made over time, the aircraft, when you make a change, you don't always have to reweigh it. Oftentimes, if you know a change or a modification, you will know what the weight and the arm is of it. If that's the case, you can, you can take what you have on this table as a starting point and you can use a weight and balance record to update it without having to reweigh the aircraft. So it can be done using calculation. However, if you're unsure, if you don't know, or if you have some kind of a modification or change where you can't specifically say what the new weight and balance is, then you may have to go through the process of weighing an aircraft. I know for a fact down here in fleet service, they rarely ever weigh an aircraft. The reason I know is they gave us their scales and they haven't been calibrated in how many years, Jeremy? Like since the early 2000s. So, you know, they don't reweigh. Most of the time they aren't doing any kind of modifications that require reweighing the aircraft. The one, and, and, and again, most of those, if you get an STC or you get an install kit from a, from a manufacturer, it's going to tell you what the weight and arm is of all the equipment you're putting in. That's part of getting an STC is calculating, getting that all figured out. Oftentimes it'll also tell you for the stuff you're removing what the weight in the arm is, right? Because they know, okay, if you're going to change out, you know, go from one, one magneto to a different magneto, they know where the old one was installed. They know what the old one weighed as long as it was a certain brand, right? Uh, and so changes in weight and balance, if you add any kind of optional equipment, we use this to update that. Now, the one modification that oftentimes can't be done purely by calculation is if you repaint an aircraft. Because you know what the total paint weighs, or you can, the manufacturer will tell it, but you don't know if it's thicker in the front and thinner in the back, or thinner in the front, thicker in the back, right? So on a small airplane, doesn't make much of a big deal. Big airplanes, the paint can weigh quite a bit where it does have to be taken into account. So when we had our planes painted, we did have to reweigh them after they came back from paint. It usually wasn't a significant change, but we had to update that basic operating weight and center of gravity. So here's an example. Uh, if we were to fill this out, so the Beach Baron, for example, figuring out the empty weight and balance. So here we have a basic empty weight, 4,321 pounds, the way we did this. We weighed on that airplane, we can weigh it with the different gear. And here, circle nose or tail, what the scale reading is. Here we have a tear, anyone know what a tear would be? Weight of a container. What are we doing to the tear? So here's the scale reading, here's the tear, here's the net weight. What's happening there? Subtracting it out. Those are all the same. What do you think those are? That's a weight that's on the scale along with the airplane. Those are wheel, that's probably from wheel chalks. We put the plane on the scales and we chalk it on the scale. So we want to know how much in this case the scales weigh so we can subtract them back, or how much the chalks weigh so we can subtract them back out. That's why it's got a tear weight there. So here's the net weight on each of those scales. 
The arm can be given, although oftentimes on the nose, we've got to measure it because your nose gear is raked out a little bit. And so, so as the gear extends or retracts, that's going to move that wheel slightly forward or slightly back. So we have to measure its distance of the axle from the, um, we measure the distance of the axle from the uh, datum. And then we get a moment. We'll look at how to calculate these in a minute. But essentially, remember, a, we have a weight times an arm gives us a moment. Okay, a weight times an arm gives us a moment. A weight times an arm gives us a moment. And then we'll talk about how to figure out the total in a little bit. But that gives us our empty weight. Okay, in this case, we measure the... And what they're doing here is... Anyone know why, why we have unusable fuel, why we're subtracting it out there? It's fuel, it's fuel we can't get off the aircraft easily. And so the assumption is that there's empty, if the fuel tanks are, even if they're empty, there's still a certain amount of fuel in there. So we're, stra we're subtracting that out in order to get basic empty weight. And if we take those weights and we throw it into a ba uh, weight and balance record, we can track changes. So here on July 18th, we did an alternator upgrade. So you'll see we've got basic empty weight in the first line. The weight, the moment. And this is a moment divided by 100. We took that, remember on here where we calculated it, the moment here was 300, uh, 319,701. Just so we're not dealing with as many numbers, when we get here, it's 3,197. Same number, it's just one's multiplied by 100. Okay. So that's the moment divided by 100. And now you can see that's there was nothing added or removed there. That's just giving us to start with. Here we remove the old style alternator from the left engine. It weighed 12 and a half pounds. We're removing it, so it's negative. Okay. The arm is given to us as 21.3. It gives us a negative moment, okay? So now we subtract the 12.5 from the 43.21, gives us 4308.5. And then we subtract, we, we add the negative moment. So add negative 3197 plus negative 2.66 gives us 3,194.34. And then, so that was removed, and then at the same time, we're going to install an updated alternator, and you can see it's a little bit lighter, right? And it's got a slightly different moment, because maybe that weight is centered differently inside the alternator. It would be, in this case, um, or sorry, a slightly different arm. It's a little bit further back. The weight's centered a little further back inside the alternator, so it gives us an alt, uh, a slightly different moment. Now it's positive, positive number times a positive number gives us a positive. And we add that to these numbers from the line above to give us 43.18.8. And that's our new, um, our new basic empty weight. And we can calculate a CG by dividing the moment by the weight. Okay? And then there's another one here on April 25th where a fire extinguisher was replaced. And maybe they decided to relocate it as well. Remove old, install new, okay? And one of them, the old one, the, the extinguisher and the bracket kind of had the same, were combined. This one, the bracket and the extinguisher, the new one, the bracket and the extinguisher, in this case, have a slightly different, you know, maybe the manufacturer gives them to you as two different numbers. And so we add those back in. We'll go through this in more detail, but it gives us ultimately, you know, now the pilots or the operator has a new empty weight and a new moment and a new CG that they can use when performing any loading calculations after these two modifications took place. So when we're doing all this, we're going to often refer back to the type certificate data sheet. And when we refer back to that, we're going to be looking at key items that are shown here. So things like engine, CG range, max weight. So that's where a lot of this, where this stuff's all listed. Okay. It's also going to give us things like number of seats and location, right? If you got to figure out, you know, putting my 250 pounds in there, what's my moment? You know, how do I affect the weight and balance of the airplane? How do I affect it if I'm sitting in the front? How do I affect it if I'm sitting in the back, right? So 
So number of seats and location, baggage, where the baggage is centered, how much it is, fuel, what the fuel CG is, oil, the datum, remember we gotta know where that datum is, how we level it when we measure, when we weigh the airplane, we have to level it. What are some of the ways you've seen to level? A couple groups have dealt with leveling or having to measure level. Where, where would the leveling locations commonly be? What's that? Like the 727 has that plumb bob in the wheel well, right? That's bigger airplanes tend to have the plumb bob and chart. Those can also be located in the tail. Mooney tail group, where'd you find level? Seam right above the baggage bay door or above the, not the baggage, the uh, tail access panel. The seam right above the tail access panel. Anyone else have to find it so far? No? So some of the other places, sometimes the seat tracks, you put a level inside on the seat track, uh, door frames, um, some airplane, the 727 also has bubble levels up in the cockpit. You can use those as kind of a rough leveling estimate. They're not as precise as that chart in the right wheel well, but they can work in some cases. Okay. Um, I don't know, Jeremy, where else have you seen them? Okay, yeah, so seat, seat rail, door frame, and some kind of skin splice are the three. Um, we had some of those two here and there, yep. So, um, amount of oil and empty weight, amount of fuel and empty weight. So if we look at our Cessna 182P, the aircraft we have sitting down in the hangar, let's look at some of the things we can find here. So here's the TCDS for this aircraft. I don't know if this revision is still in date or not. I didn't update the slides, but it'll still work. They may have changed the thing here or there. I doubt there's been many changes to the Cessna 182P that was built back in the 1960s or 70s. <laughs> but here is our engine. There's a couple different models here. So, you know, even on the 182P, there were two options. So now we got to look at our aircraft serial number. Why is that important? Why is the engines why why is the engine type so important? They have a certain weight. What else? Different CGs. Okay. Yep. They have a the engine itself has its own CG, which works out to be the arm used for the engine. What else? What do engines contain? Uh, no, they make power. They turn dinosaurs into power. They contain oil, and the oil could have a different center of gravity. Think about the shape of different oil pans, right? So an oil pan that's flat is going to have a different CG than an oil pan like the 0470s that's at an angle, right? That you put in an angle, and the, the CG is going to be further to the deeper section of it. So different engines, you got to be aware of that. Okay, here's our CG range, empty weight CG. You can see CG range, this is our loaded CG. They allow at 29.50, they allow from 39.5 to 48.5. If it's only loaded to 2,250 pounds or less, it can go further forward. It can go from 33 to 48.5. Lighter airplanes tend to be less likely to stall, so they have a less restrictive CG range when it's loaded lighter. This is the difference, if anyone's familiar with Cessnas, they rate their airplanes for utility and uh, normal category. This is the difference. This is normal category up top. This is utility category at the bottom. Utility category allows you to do some very limited acrobatics. I don't even remember what they are. High, high bank turns and some kind of spins, right? Six, up to a 90? 60, 60 degree bank. Say so 90, we're getting into fighter jet territory here. Um, you know, in normal category, they can't do spins, and I don't think they can go past what 45 or 30, something like that. So, the only way to be in this utility category is if there are, um, if you only have a pilot and co-pilot, I believe. You can't have anyone sitting in the back seat, basically. Uh, and then. You can see their empty weight CG range. Remember I said it, oftentimes it doesn't matter what the empty weight CG range is? That's just on the ground. 
Now, if your empty weight CG is way off, the pilots will never be able to load the airplane in such a way that the loaded weight will work out. And so you got to be aware of that. Uh, maximum weight, 2,950 pounds here. Number of seats and their location. So four seats. The two front seats, they're at 32 to 50. The rear seats are at 74. Why does one have a range and one doesn't? You can what? The front ones slide fore and aft to adjust for your legs so you can reach the rudder pedals. The rear seat, that bench seat, it's fixed. It doesn't move. Okay. Maximum baggage and where it's located, weights as well as the CG. Now, not everyone's bag is evenly loaded, but the pilots kind of have to make an assumption that your bag is relatively easily loaded, evenly loaded. Right? You don't have an anvil at one end of your bag and you know feathers at the other end of your bag where it's going to want to tip one way or the other. But I mean, there's only so much you can do here, right? You can't be like, okay, everyone is coming on the airplane. You got to make sure you pack your bag so that the CG is centered in your bag, right? No, you don't do that. You don't, you don't make sure your bag is centered and nice and balanced when you go fly somewhere. No? Okay. Maybe it's just me, I guess. Um, fuel oil capacity and fuel CG, and these can get really complicated. Uh, because part of it can be depending on serial numbers. You can see older planes had 65 gallon tanks, newer ones they went to 84, and then you got 61, and there's gallons and gallons usable. And do they have the long range tanks or the standard range tanks? And yeah, then they got a note one for usable. Yeah, go, go look at note one. That's going to have more explanation, and you got to really pay attention to that kind of thing. Oil capacity. 12 quarts, negative 15, six quarts usable. Oh, we got to see note one for data on that. That's going to be important. That has to deal with aircraft certification. Yeah. Yep. Well, the, the CG location is going to be based on where that oil tank is located. Right? So a dry sump, you have a remote oil tank that's mounted somewhere else. So the oil tank may have a totally different CG than the engine. Um, but it'll still be included in there. You can, so, and for both of those I mentioned, seeing note one for undrainable fuel and oil. Datum location, so where's this datum located? This is pretty common on Cessnas, front of the firewall. Okay, front surface of the firewall. It's not just the firewall. Because the firewall is a couple, what, uh, 60 thousandths thick or something like that. I don't think that 60 thousandths is going to make a big difference, but it's easier to get to the front face of the firewall to measure off of. Where do we level it? So here is upper door sill. Or on some of them, you can use the top surface of the center line of the tail cone. Or here you go, Jeremy, the jig located nut plates and screws on the left of the tail cone. So different ways of uh leveling depending on the serial number the age of the aircraft and that kind of thing and then here we get to certification basis and this is where it's important for that oil was this airplane certified under car 3 or 14 cfr part 23 or part 25 if you're you're doing something like that what's the difference there who knows what 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 is car 3 versus 14 cfr 23 We're having a regs class review right now. Certification basis. What's CAR 3 versus 14 CFR 23 and 25? Nope. CAR 3 is old. Anyone know the year? I think it's on here, isn't it? Yep, it's on there. It's on there. March 1st, 1978. Okay, that's when CAR was the civil... Civil aeronautic regulations or aviation regulations? Ah, yes, so I stumped Jeremy. Doesn't happen very often. Um, oh, civil air regulations, it's right there. Look, see, I just gotta read. Civil air regulations, that's the car. Okay, that preceded the FAR, the Federal, Federal Aviation Regulations. So, you know, aircraft that were built before March 1st, 1978 were certified under CAR 3. And in the CAR 3 definitions for 
these general aviation aircraft, you had to subtract the weight of engine oil. So empty weight did not include engine oil. Okay? With the advent of the CFRs, 14 CFR, particularly we're looking at part 23 right now, so 25 can fall in that category too, um, which is your, your transport category aircraft is part 25 and part 23 is anything that's not a transport category aircraft. Fixed wing, I'm not dealing with rotary stuff here, but fixed wing. Um, you do include engine oil. Engine oil is considered part of empty weight, which to me, that's a logical assumption, right? The airplane's never gonna fly without engine oil, right? Or it won't fly very far without engine oil. Anyone ever left Jiffy Lube without oil? I made a lap around the parking lot one time. Huh? It was an old clunker. Let's just say I was smart. I noticed there was no oil pressure about the time I was pulling out of the bay and just made a lap. <laughs> they never put any in. They put the plug in, but never filled it. And I kind of thought I, I never saw them fill it. So I was kind of wondering, and I was like, that's why I was watching the oil gauge really closely. And I'm like, yeah, it never came up. Okay. So why do we air, weigh an aircraft? I told you earlier, oftentimes you can calculate you know, based on what it is, we can calculate. One option I gave you was fuel, right? So empty weight, empty weight CG aircraft can be modified, and sometimes it's you're not able to uh, update that accurately. You may not have en enough information. Okay, so aircraft are modified are one. Okay. Go away. Sorry, something weird is going on here. Oh, no, we're good. Okay. The other one is aircraft get old and put on pounds, kind of like people. Some even get pregnant. Anyone ever seen the belugas before? They're for carrying large wing sections and fuselage sections to the Airbus factory. Yep. They make a plane to carry planes. Yep. And now they have the... Uh... You can't, because they're, they're moving them... A across oceans and things like that. I think one of the Airbus plants, there's like no way to get rail to it because it's so landlocked and mountain locked. So our aircraft over time, the ones we flew at the airline, they would just get heavier. We would weigh them, we'd weigh them again, no modifications, no repaint, but the next time we weigh them, they would be heavier. Anyone have any ideas why? No, well, not the wear and tear, but who said, so dirt, Grease, dust. Okay, I'll give you the nasty details. Most of it was moisture from people breathing, and it would soak into the insulation blankets that are behind all the cabin interior walls. The other part of it would be things like dust, dirt, skin cells, and everything else that sloughs off your body into the carpet, into the floorboards, into the air ducting. Yeah, yummy, huh? We'd pull the HEPA filters out. We'd have, we'd have recirculation filters. They're big HEPA filters. You pull them out. They had a whole wig stuck to the side of them. Lots of curly hairs and all kinds of dust. You're like mask, gloves, double bag it. Yeah. Okay. So when we weigh these, well, let's, uh, I think we're at a good break point. Let's go ahead and take a break with that pleasant image of skin cells, hair, breath. <laughs> The, the hot moisture from your breath soaking into the insulation blankets. And uh, we'll get into the actual weighing process when we come back.